Hi, welcome to the Max Weber program. My name is Eva Maria Moschek. I'm a fellow in history here at the EUI. And it's a great pleasure to have Nairi Woods here today um, to answer a couple of questions about her intellectual biography and her most recent work. And um, Professor Woods is the uh, Dean of Oxford University's School of Government. And she's written lucidly about global governments and most importantly, perhaps, about the um, major international financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. And um, later today, Professor Woods will give a talk here at the EUI that is called Backlash, is Globalization Killing um, Democracy? So we have about 20 minutes for our interview, and um, without further ado, we thought we'd delve right into the question. So let's start with your intellectual biography. And I should say thank you very much for being <laughs> here also. Pleasure. Yeah. So yes, I'm Stefano Marcuzzi, I'm also a Max Weber uh, fellow here at the UI, affiliated with the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies. And so I fell on me to ask, ask the first question. Um, so, well, um, we read that your uh, choice to study international relations were somewhat accidental, um, uh, if, I, if I may put it that way. Uh, originally, you were much more interested in economics and, and law. So, could you explain how you came to the discipline and what intrigued you the most about this discipline, which you know, ultimately convinced you or persuaded you to pursue an academic career in international relations? Um, gosh, that's a little embarrassing because I don't really have a high-minded answer. Um, I had, as you said, studied sort of maths, economics, law in New Zealand, and I guess from the start I was passionate about public policy and government and what governments can do and what they can't do, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. I think that's always been my driving passion um, because I think trying to get government to work better is one of the most impactful things that you can do. Absolutely. So when I, I won a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford University and to my distress they had no degree in public policy, they had no degree that was in law and economics together and it was actually rather by chance that I happened upon a degree which was called an MPhil in international relations but which was as far as I could see the only degree that permitted me to do some law and some economics right. under the same right. roof. Umbrella, yeah, now, sure. of course, once I started studying international relations, I think what struck me was how absolutely important it is to understand um, history, not just European history, but global history. If you want to understand what governments can and should do, you really need that. And I think one of the strongest things I took from my master's in international relations was you know, a much deeper sense of, of history. And, you know, I would confess that when I first encountered what international relations scholars called theory, I was surprised because I was coming from a more narrow um, understanding of theory from economics and from mathematics. But um, I think that there are some powerful insights that international relations scholars bring to understanding governance. I think there's quite a lot that they should do that they don't do as well. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, following up on um, your your research interests, you, you wrote um, that your work on, on global financial institutions was not so much prompted perhaps by your readings of history, but um, very um, contemporary experiences or professional experiences that you had in Latin America and Russia, if I'm correct. Um, perhaps if you could elaborate a bit on that and um, and also um, say to, to what extent becoming Dean of Oxford School of Government um, has affected your academic interests, if it has. Yeah. So I did my doctorate at the end of the 1980s when the world had come through a sovereign debt crisis and I found that very compelling. Why were these governments in countries so indebted? Um, and why did the solution to that problem have such terrible consequences, particularly for their working, for their working people? Um, which is why I wrote my doctorate about sovereign debt restructuring and became very interested in the role that the IMF and World Bank were playing in the process of debt restructuring. And actually history was important because my benchmark was the debt crises which had occurred before the IMF and World Bank were ever even invented. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a comparison mm -hmm. point to think about what the intervening power of these institutions actually was. Mm -hmm. 
um, the, the School of Government, so Oxford had never had a School of Government, so 10 years ago I began to really wrestle with that, because for, for a decade I'd been working with finance ministers, central bank governors, with different governments who really needed some applied answers to problems they were facing, and it seemed to me that nobody was giving those applied answers, no academics were, and so these governments kept turning to very expensive consultancies. Uh, that struck me as a pity when the great universities of the world have some of the smartest people in them. And that's what drove me to start thinking about the fact that Oxford, you know, at the moment the world's top university on one ranking, um, why didn't we have a school of government that could link researchers much more directly to the applied problems of government? Mm -hmm. um, so for me it was a project that began ten years ago, um, putting together a, a vision of what the school might be, and it it's been a fantastic project to work on. The school opened uh, six years ago. We had our first cohort of students five years ago. We're now in our, you know, um, sixth year. And it's, a, it's been an exciting application of lots of ideas of how you build institutions, how you build institutions inside an 800-year-old institution, um, how you mobilize people around the issue, how you fundraise outside, on what basis, should you accept funds or not, what kinds of students should you recruit to a school that's trying to improve government, what are the sorts of people that have the greatest impact on government, because they're not necessarily the sort of people that are going to write the best doctorates. Mm -hmm. Would you say then that it was more of a, uh, a practical public service project as opposed to influencing your, your own intellectual um, work uh, very concretely? Oh, I would put it the other way. It has required every ounce of my intellect to get to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, each of us has an intellect that we can use in different ways, but you've got to apply it to everything right. in an institution if you're going to try and get it right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been a completely consuming project. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Yeah, could you also uh, outline briefly um, uh, the nature of your most recent work? Um, and um, how you got interested in the topic and how it relates, if it does in any ways, to your earlier mm -hmm. writings. Mm -hmm. Well, I would call the Blavatnik School of Government my latest project mm -hmm. yeah. um, because it is what has, it's the project to which I've given the most time and it is an intellectual project. It's an applied problem of government Absolutely. and governance and it takes you right into um, what are the current problems of government which rigorous independent research could really deliver some answers to? And it's a constant surprise to me how little academics ask that question. Academics all over the world. Yeah. There are these huge areas. Let me give you one example. Delivery units. Governments across the world, there are several dozen governments building delivery units. There are at least two major management consultancies who advise them to. There's not a single academic in the world who's done a rigorous independent study of whether they work or not, to what end do they work, do they fulfill their promise. Yeah. This, is, this is an issue that governments are implementing Absolutely. and yet there's no research on it. So I look and I say, look, there are hundreds of thousands of brilliant academics in the world. How could it be that none of them are answering that question, mm -hmm. and so many of them are doing so much research. And putting forward concrete <coughs> proposals uh, uh, about you know, what, to, what to do, maybe, as well. Yeah, maybe, but I don't think that academics should feel that they have to put forward the solution. You know, I think there's... there's but, but at least some academics should at least listen for the questions that governments need answers to and apply themselves to what we know about that question that could help governments do better. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, it's, so it sounds a bit like the school offers the kind of studies that you would have liked to have taken up as a, as a road scholar when you came to Oxford in the first place. Oh, definitely, in definitely. In some kind of yeah. ultra-narcissism, I've built the program <laughs> that I would have loved to have studied, most definitely. But the, the other part of you know your questions is really about um, the, my kind of intellectual agenda. and. What I continue to work on is how we can get global organizations to work better. And that actually has a great link to how you get 
government agencies and governments themselves to work better. I see that as a unifying concept. And actually how you get a school to work better and how you get a university to work better. These issues of governance share some really big features and academics have quite a lot to say about them. So behaviourists can tell us actually, I think, some really interesting, exciting things about how you motivate people, um, how you bring purpose to their jobs and why that so often works better than material incentives and monitoring. So there's a, a huge critique of the new public management that sits in there that you can study in public agencies, you can study in international organisations as I've done, and you can apply when you manage a large part of the university. So the, these, these issues are linked, the legitimacy of governance, you know, who should sit on a board, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a company, whether it's in government, who has decision making power. In tonight's lecture I'll talk a little bit about what I see as the illegitimacy of referendums in elected democracies. Mm -hmm. You know, because these questions, and they're part of every organisation um, that needs to both make legitimate decisions and efficient decisions. Okay, so um, since you brought up your lecture tonight, um, which, is, which is called, as, as I said earlier, Backlash is Globalization Killing Democracy, um, let's, let's talk for a minute about that. So, um, global interdependence has long been posited as a, as a problem for democracy, suggesting, as you as you just um, alluded to, that, that the people and their elected governments are no longer able to rule um, their states as they wish because of outside factor factors outside their polity. So um, in, a, in a 2012 um, Guardian Roundtable, I think you referred to this as a bit of a cop-out argument, um, which I quite liked. So uh, I wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit on that and um, to what extent does the title of your talk suggest that you've changed your mind mm -hmm. uh, about this? Um, I think you're wanting a preview of the lecture tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, my view is this, it's that globalization does pose some clear new challenges to governments, but that um, you can't see the current backlash just as a backlash against globalization. It's a backlash against what I see as the stagnation of our political organizations and political systems, which has left people feeling that they have no voice. And so there's a simple argument which politicians are deploying, which says it's globalization and foreigners who are to blame for the fact that you feel you have no voice. But that's not just a dangerous argument, it's a wrong argument. Mm -hmm. Um, but the reason why people feel they have no voice is because the large-scale organizations that were created, many of them in the 1930s, which was the last time we saw this level of fear and insecurity and post-economic collapse backlash, um, that the um, organizations created at that time, mass political parties, um, but that were actually active, that people actually participated in and built agendas within um, trade union movements that were much wider spread than they had been before and gave people a sense that they could actually have some say in the system that they were a part of. And that the generation that grew up with those organizations and has watched them decline and become marginalized are exactly the generation who are now voting for Brexit and for Trump. Mm. It's that slightly older, white, working class who had a sense of entitlement to having a voice in organized politics and feel they no longer have one. And that's something we have to take seriously. And we have to think about how better to manage globalization, but we also have to think about how to innovate and renovate democracy and the organizations which create the link between people and government. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Well, following, following up on what you just said, uh, I mean, it seems that today democracy is going against globalization in a sense, you know, Brexit, Trump, or the extreme right mm -hmm. European movements. Um, let me put it this way, it seems that democratically elected governments seek, or are likely to seek in the near future, um, renewed protectionism, uh, thus limiting um, global integration in a sense. I don't know. So I think would, I you, would you? Would you, I mean, can't today's topic, is globalization killing democracy, be happening the other way around? Can it be democracy in a sense, 
which is killing globalization. Um, I think that two, that you're putting two different propositions there. The first one, um, I would say you can't, I don't think you can lump together um, all those who led the campaign for Brexit and voted for it, and all those who led the Trump campaign and voted for it as anti-globalizers. Um, there is a whole group of leading politicians in Britain and leading business um, folk who passionately believe in Brexit because they believe that the world economy is a free market and the only thing standing between them and that free market is the European Union. Now, factually, they're wrong, but that's their belief. In other words, that's the feeling. they want to be part of globalization and they feel that the European Union is the Pretty barrier much. between yeah. them and globalization. And likewise, let's not forget that there's a huge group that supported Trump, that continue to support Trump for one simple reason. He promised to lower taxes for the rich. Well, that ri th you know, those rich benefit massively from globalization. You know, three of his top appointments are all Goldman Sachs bankers. Um, these are people who need sort of globalization. So I think to imagine that they're anti-globalization forces is, is probably to, to depict them too simply. Absolutely, that's very interesting. I mean, I think in part you've already answered our next question, which is um, going to take you back to the um, 90s and, and early 2000s, which already saw a very different anti-globalization um, movement, a, a, a populist also perhaps, and leftist if you will. And um, our question was um, to what extent, um, or, uh, and, and also, we should say that much of the error then was directed at, against the global financial institutions rather than against national elites as it is today. Mm -hmm. So um, we were wondering to what extent you see this anti-globalization movement, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that way, of the 90s and 2000s as connected to this new anti-elitist um, mm -hmm. xenophobia, mm -hmm. if I may put it that mm -hmm. way, that we see today, yeah. or is there no connection at all? Uh, that's a great question because they're very interesting and different currents. So the argument that was being made in the late 1990s was an argument that said we have legitimate democratically elected governments and they are being uh, limited, constrained or pushed towards globalization by organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO. So you saw these big movements which were mainly around environmentalism, Poverty. So people saying, you know, we think that governments should put poverty number one, and for example, the IMF is putting debt repayment number one, or we think that environmental protection should be number one, and in the World Trade Organization, we see environment environmental protection being contested and pushed down to a lower priority, and so they came together and argued that we had to um, we had to push for these organisations to have broader, more inclusive agendas, to listen to other, other interests of society, and therefore, you know, to become more legitimate. And in that sense, it was anti the globalizers. Um, what we're seeing today in this backlash against the elite is a rather different mixed coalition of people. Um, but there aren't that many that belong to both of those groups. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I'm thinking of one of the groups, um, I think they're called Citizen Watch, who has fought very consistently against TPP and against trade and investment agreements um, that really feel they've won. Mm -hmm. um, but they felt they won when they saw both President-elect Trump and Secretary Clinton mm -hmm. both voicing against the TPP. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the few, that's one of the few overlapping points. I mean, I haven't really thought about the, the overlap between those two groups, but I do think they're different. And today's, today's, today's backlash is not on the streets. Mm -hmm. It's people using their vote to, f to force governments to hear them. Whereas in a way, the protesters of the 1990s were aware that their governments could hear them, and 
that they wanted their governments to change their positions on these international organisations. I think there's mm -hmm. some important differences. Right. I mean, that's the most um, immediate successor that will come to mind is rather the Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. um, but um, still, in terms of the protectionism that at least some factions um, or that um, Trump alludes to, um, there seems to be um, uh, some degree of overlap. And but the uh, times yeah. have changed dramatically. Right. Don't forget yeah. that that in the 1990s, when those protest movements were beginning, and right through until 2007, the world was globalizing at a very accelerating rate. And so you had protest movements saying, hold on, in the wake of globalization, you've got all this human and environmental distress, mm -hmm. so we have to fight for, for those issues. And then 2008 comes along, and, you know, let's not forget that for six months globalization stopped dead in its tracks. Mm -hmm. Global trade collapsed. Global financial movements completely retreated. So there was this extraordinary moment of stop, pause, and then a very, very slow and painful recovery after that, where um, I think the issues have become different different mm -hmm. issues and the role of the international organizations has, has changed. Mm -hmm. Well, coming to our, some concluding <laughs> remarks, I think we could um, maybe um, draw or um, reshape our definition of modern democracy. I mean, because um, the notion of democracy itself, uh, it has evolved and changed significantly throughout history. Um, and it seems to me, I'd like to have your opinion on this, mm -hmm. um, that you can really have democracy today mm -hmm. where you have a clear state national state. Not necessarily a strong one, but you need a geographically identified and politically uh, well-structured national state. Um, now, if you're happy with this definition, I suppose the following question would be, how do you see today's increasing disintegration of the notion of the national state? In other words, is democracy still possible in a liquid world? I don't think the state is disintegrating at all. Mm -hmm. I think that governments across the world are making different choices. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that governments who are making choices to stamp their kind of sovereign control are actually um, winning the trust of the people they govern. And it, 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 it makes you sit back and say, you know, why has protectionism become a dirty word? We're actually, Good point. <laughs> most people yeah. quite like the idea of being protected, protected of course. right? Yeah. Protected in a world where terrorism is a threat, protected in a world where wars and conflict are a threat, protected in a world where unemployment is a threat, protected in a world where your children not, might not be able to go to school or eat healthy food or drink clean water. These are problems for people everywhere, in Europe, in China, in Latin America, in Africa. Um, actually, although you know, the elite, and I saw that they were being called the Plut Plutonomists, <laughs> um, uh, have branded protectionism something that governments shouldn't do. It highlights this huge gap to their populations who are like, but that's what, we, that's, that's what I elect you to do. I want to be able to walk down my street at night without being attacked. I want to be able to live in a country where I feel some minimum security where my children are going to have a chance to grow up and be educated, have some health care. There are things that I want protected. And the governments that are doing that are doing much better on public trust and on winning the consent of the governed. The governments that aren't doing that, the people are starting to, to rebel against and say, what's the point of electing you if you don't provide me with these minimum things? Absolutely, Professor Woods. Thank you very much for being here. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation with you, and we're looking forward to listening to your lecture later tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>